but I, I do want to take a little bit more time to show you how this can link back to the brain, since this is a summer school for brains, minds, and machines, and say a little bit about learning. So I'll just spend a little bit of time on these last two questions. Um, on the neural circuit side, again, what we might be asking here is, so here's the picture you've seen from DiCarlo and Dan Yeamans and others. You know, again, the striking success in relating uh, you know, some kind of computational model, like in the form of a neural network, to the parts of the brain that do that kind of thing. In particular, a neural network trained to do object recognition relating to the ventral stream, that part of the primate brain that seems to be primarily doing that. So we could ask, what are the prospects for doing something like that here? Okay, well, that's going to require a number of things. We're going to have to find the relevant parts of the brain, and we're going to have to build neurally plausible or mappable models. And we've been starting to do all of that. So just to sort of show you what that might be like. Okay, first we might say, well, can we start to build neurally plausible models of how you might invert probabilistic programs? So this is, this is in a sense, you could think of this as almost like an alternative theory of the ventral stream, right? Could we, if we see vision not as you know, solving a, a recognition classification task, but is actually trying to invert graphics, what would that look like? Can we build neurally plausible models of that? Now, I already said we could. That's these fast models. And they're really good models because they are much more satisfying from an engineering point of view. And they're also mappable onto the brain. So here's an example of something that, that started in a way with the summer school. Uh, it's a collaboration with Vinrick Freewald, who you'll hear from tomorrow. He's one of the experts, along with Doris Sow, in studying monkey face perception. Um, these days, he's really broadened out into a lot of other areas of social perception and, and other kinds of uh, monkey cognitive neuroscience. Um, but um, I'll show you some work that we started doing with Vinrick that has really been driven by Ilker Yildirim, who's a research scientist working in our lab and with Vinrick where we said, OK, well, can we, can we develop basically a neural network to do inverse graphics that is sort of an alternative to the standard classification view um, of, of model of the ventral stream? And it's especially interesting in the context of faces, because as you'll hear from Vinrick, I'm not really going to uh, steal his thunder on this. Uh, I'm just going to show you what we've been doing together. Um, but as you'll hear, um, he and Doris and uh, others, but they've really done a lot of pioneering work here, have really been able to characterize in, in really unprecedented precise detail what the neural representations at different stages of the ventral stream look like for faces. And they build on work that, that you'll hear more about from Nancy Kamwisher also in just functional localization of specific modules or, or so-called patches of cortical circuitry that really seem to be very specific to processing faces. Okay? Um, and they, they, in particular, identified using monkey fMRI a network of six, and now it's more, little patches of, of stuff along the ventral stream in macaque IT cortex um, that you know, all seem to be responsive to faces. And what we did with, was, with Ilker was to basically build one of these inverse graphics networks. It combines today's you know, deep network technology with an approach to, to training that's, that's inspired by something called the wake sleep algorithm. If you've heard of this, this is a really nice idea from Jeff Hinton. Uh, one of the deep learning pioneers and in inventor of that phrase, deep learning. Um, but before he had the phrase deep learning, he had this idea, and I, I think it's even better than deep learning. Um, but it's a way to basically use a generative model, like a probabilistic program, although he used a much simpler kind of neural network, but we're using a, graphics, a probabilistic graphics program. Use that to train what's called a recognition model, which is a model, a neural network, that is trained to do the inverse probabilistic inference. So it's a mo it's a, it's like, it looks a lot like a convnet, but it is a con kind of convnet, but its outputs are not class labels like object labels or people identity labels. Its outputs are the inputs to the graphics engine. And importantly, that, that gives it two different, two special properties. One is it's a much richer space of outputs, right? It's not just a, a discrete label, but it's the whole 3D shape and texture, for example. The other is that it doesn't, even though the outputs are much richer, the training data don't have to be provided by the world or a human labeler or whatever. It's, it's what we call self-supervised. The generative model, the graphics engine in your head, provides all the training data you need because you just, it, this is the sleep part or the dream learning part. The generative model can imagine, you sort of imagine different faces from different viewpoints. You just synthesize your own images in your head. That's your top-down imagery system, if you like or dream system. And that provides you know, arbitrarily large amounts of very rich training data for these bottom-up recognition networks. 
So Ilker built one of these models. And um, uh, this is just, it shows that it can effectively invert the graphics engine. But the key cool thing that he showed from a neuroscience point of view is if you take data like this, this is from one of uh, Vinrick and Doris's classic papers by now, where they took three face patches, uh, so the so-called middle face patches, and then these the anterior uh, ones and ones in the middle. So there's AL, which is in, sort of in between in the feed forward. Th these, these, just like the rest of the ventral stream, there's a sort of pri there's a primary feed forward circuit here that drives the, the initial wave of activity when you flash up images. Um, but there's there's also feedback. But there's definitely a feed forward path through the circuitry, and there's these three stages from ML, MF to AL to AM. And they characterize them in different ways, but in this paper, they characterize them in terms of these similarity matrices. If, if you guys know the RSA style similarity matrix or RDM, okay. So there's what, these are 175 by 175 matrices where each row and column is, is a different face or a particular face from a particular viewpoint. And they're blocked by viewpoints. So there's seven by seven blocks for the viewpoints. And then within that, there's 25 by 25 structure of, of face, different face individuals, okay. And what you see as you go down the hierarchy or up in, pro in processing is you go from this kind of seven by seven blocky structure to uh, this more banded structure where those, b those tight bands represent basically the, si the individual level similarity. So it's kind of the way they originally interpreted it is this is you know, face recognition. It's come to represent invariant identity independent of pose. Whereas early on, you can hardly see the identities in there at all, but you really see the poses. And then it goes through this interesting intermediate phase of what they called mirror symmetry, where you have a lot of similarity between like the two different profile views or even somewhat the two different 45 degree views. So it's kind of, it's still viewpoint dependent. There's little bits of identity and variant stuff in there, but it's got this sort of mirror symmetry response. And what Ilker showed, which is really, you know, kind of, I, I still find this remarkable every time I look at this, is that a model that's trained to invert the face graphics engine basically produces those same kinds of patterns. And you can quantify this. Here I'm just showing a picture. He also contrasted it with many other ways of building models. And he spent a long time developing and testing many alternative models. This is actually, here's a, this is a model which is a state of the art or, well, not exactly state of the art, it's a few years old at this point. But it's, it represents more or less the state of the art approach that's been practiced in computer vision for the last few years for face recognition. Um, it's the so-called VGG face network. And it's really good at face recognition, including for these images. It's just not the way the brain seems to work. <laughs> um, it produces uh, just very different patterns, and I won't go through the details, but it's just interesting that a network which is, this is a network which is trained, like the ventral stream models that Jim DiCarlo talked about, it's trained to classify objects, okay, in this case the objects are face individuals, um, as opposed to inverting the graphics engine, and it just does a rather less good job. Um, you can test these models behaviorally with various illusions. Another thing that's kind of cool about them is that you can interpret their intermediate representations. So, you know, again, one of the contentious issues, especially as deep learning and deep networks, you know, really start to transform what kind of models we can build of the brain, is is there something interpretable in these models? Is you know, or is or is is the is the goal of neuroscience now to just like you know generate a lot of training data and explain a lot of variance? Um, so I don't know if Jim DiCarlo talked about this much in his lecture, but it's something that you know we we debate a lot around CBMM. Um, but what's nice about these models is because I mean it, it is partly in virtue of how they are built, right? To 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 you know when you, if you have a causal model, especially one that has like multiple interpretable stages, as as you see on the left there for a face graphics engine, then the most efficient way to invert it is just basically to turn around the arrows. That exploits what's called conditional independence in the causal direction. And that leads to a model which naturally can be potentially interpreted, where you can say, let me consider different layers and see, do they seem to represent an approximation in the, in the recognition pipeline to some stage in the generative model? And interestingly, this, this middle patch level here, which I was describing, that's really the first stage of, this, of, of the uh, proper IT cortex part of um, or the middle on up advanced part of IT cortex. I mean, it has this kind of blocky structure by viewpoint, but it's not arbitrary. There's also similarity structure among the viewpoints, which is very well captured, not by the raw pixels 
of the face, but actually by what are sometimes called intrinsic images, or it's very similar to Mars 2.5D sketch, a map of surface normals or depth. Basically, uh, uh, what's, what or people call in vision like a mid-level vision representation. Basically, a representation of the visible surface properties of faces seems to be a, a, a reasonable approximation to what's being computed in that middle stage of processing. But that is, that is also a standard rep representation in the graphics pipeline. As you go, in, especially in game graphics engines, right? Um, as you go from 3D to 2D, it's very useful in your graphics engine to pass through a 2.5D or surface representation. Because if you want to render in real time, as things change, you really, it's really in your interest to ignore all the parts of the world that you can't see. <laughs> and something like a 2.5D sketch or an intrinsic image depth map does exactly that. It represents just the, the let's say, the depth or the surface orientation to just the, the nearest visible surface along any direction from where I am. So I think, I mean, for those of you who know the history of computational vision uh, and David Marr's important role in that or the idea of intrinsic images, which something that my dad actually uh, helped to invent and pioneer, so I have a lot of um, affection for this for these ideas, which were early ideas in how to build computer vision systems well before deep learning or neural networks. Um, but it, and, 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 and these are ideas which, I, especially Mars version, you know, uh, David Mars' book on vision uh, is a great book and everybody usually will recommend read it for the philosophy, but he's probably not right about any of the details. I actually think that he was right about important details, especially the 2.5D sketch. And I think we've started to understand both why, because of the way, the role that that plays, that kind of mid-level representation plays in doing inverse graphics. And we can now actually build systems in which something like that, you know, through a combination of design principles and learning seems to emerge, and we can even see evidence for it in the brain. So I think that's pretty exciting. And it's, you know, it's not, uh, this isn't common sense. This is just what we got when we started to think, how do these tools meet up with the brain? Um, in work that I mentioned um, a little bit before, John Jin Wu, who's an advanced PhD student working partly with me and with a number of others at MIT, like lots and lots of people, <laughs> um, he's a super collaborator in addition to a super researcher, um, has used similar ideas, but now in computer vision settings, well beyond faces, to build systems that can say, for example, infer the 3D structure of common objects like chairs, but also using these mid-level 2.5D type representations. And I'll just refer you, uh, since time is short, to his work if you're interested in that. But check out, for example, um, either his NIPS paper from last year, which was called Marnet, or his recent to be presented ECCV paper, um, which has some other name, um, <laughs> that's something about incorporating a shape prior, which adds this, it takes the same idea, but also adds in a prior on shape. Um, and it's really pretty cool right now that we can build systems that, uh, for example, will take an image of a chair, and, after, and they're built with the knowledge, a lot of the knowledge of 3D chairs. So this is not a system that, you know, um, it's not designed to discover the 3D world. It's just designed to see 3D. Um, but it's pretty cool at this point that we can build these systems that can take, you know, uh, many different kinds of real images of chairs and then produce, well, his system is, is this one. It's not perfect, but they're producing these pretty rich 3D models of both the visible and the non-visible parts of the chair. Um, a lot of progress is still being made on this, and there's a number of other groups uh, that work on this. A lot of people, for example, at Berkeley and Jatendra Malik's group have made very nice progress on these things. And I think together the computer vision community is really making great strides. Um, and, and the problem of 3D object perception from 2D images, you know, is one that, that will be um, solved in the relatively near future using the combination of tools that I've been talking about here, right? The idea of probabilistic generative models, probabilistic graphics models, and in this case, deep learning systems that, that can be trained to provide fast approximate inverses. All right. Um, now, what about for actual common sense physics and psychology? Well, so here we have to start off by finding the right parts of the brain. We don't already have the ventral stream, right? Um, and some work that you'll hear about from both Vinrick and Nancy Kamwisher uh, in the next couple of days I mean, you know, Nancy has been working on this kind of thing for, for longer than anybody, really using fMRI to try to find parts of high-level vision, if you like, or, high le or where perception meets cognition. Recently, we've done some work together. This is work mostly done by Jason Fisher, who's now was in her lab as a postdoc and is now at Hopkins. Um, 
and has been excitingly extended and is in the process of being extended by Sarah Schwetman, who's a current PhD student with Nancy and, and with me. Um, but we've, we've, we've tried to identify what we think of as the brain's physics engine. So this is basically, we, we give people tasks like the ones you've seen, a number of different tasks, and we say what parts of the brain functionally, selectively underlie these computations. And we found a network, this was published two years ago um, in PNAS, um, of, uh, of premotor and parietal areas, which seems to be the, the key area for the computations I've been talking about. Uh, now, um, what's interesting about this, there's a number of things interesting about this um, that motivate further study of this area, right? Our goal in this work is not to stop here. This is just the first step. Now, having found the, what we think are the relevant parts of the brain, now we want to study how they work, okay? But one thing is that we're far from the first people to focus on these parts of the brain. So similar, if not maybe perhaps identical, brain networks have been identified with a number of other functions previously, um, especially as a network of areas involved in action planning and tool use. Okay? I've mentioned tools before, right? Like the crows and the other animals and the, and the kids. And I've also mentioned action planning, right? I mentioned the Mujoko physics engine, right? Um, so this to me was, um, I can't say I predicted exactly this, but <laughs> It was sort of exactly what I was hoping to see in a sense, based on not my personal preference, but just what I know from the engineering and robotics side, right? Um, at this point, um, if you look in, for people who build humanoid robots and try to get them to, to walk around, especially over complex terrain, um, or to pick up things or to manipulate objects, the best ways of doing it and producing really natural humanoid robot motion take these physics engines that try to calculate the physically most efficient path for the robot given the physical constraints of its body, the environment, and the objects. Okay. Um, so it's not, it, it, from that point of view, it wouldn't be a surprise um, to say that, well, you know, given the needs of having to do that, you know, if, if, if that's what, I mean, if the brain, if evolution effectively found a similar solution, then that same solution should be useful for a lot of other things than just moving your body around, just like those Mujoko engines or other similar engines that roboticists have been building. It's, it's all about forces and masses and friction, okay? Um, so it does seem to be true, at least there's suggestive evidence that that's what's going on. Sarah's been, been looking in and trying to actually decode mass uh, you know, looking for key physical properties, starting with mass, which is one of the most important. And she finds that she can decode from individual subjects' brains the mass of objects having observed various physical interactions here. And she's worked hard to control and tease out a number of possible confounds, and we're really at this point pretty confident about this. Um, you'll hear a little bit about this also from, from Nancy, but most excitingly, she's used what's called a searchlight method, which means if you don't know this, this method, it means you basically, you look over anywhere in the brain to see where can you reliably above chance decode a certain property like um, mass of an object. And it turns out it picks out exactly the same areas as we independently identify just what seems to underlie like physical prediction. So this is really striking uh, that she's found this. And you'll hear a lot more from Nancy and Vinrick about analogous brain networks for understanding agents. Um, the, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip this other than to just advertise some cool pa a cool paper that we just helped to inspire, but it's really great work by the roboticist Mark Toussaint, who inspired by these ideas about tool use and physics engines, has gotten robots to be able to, to do the kinds of things that crows or apes can do, as well as humans and children, right, human children, which is, you know, flexibly use objects in all sorts of complex ways to achieve goals. Um, and he's, he's, a, he's actually put these sort of uh, intuitive physics engines into the best robotic, he sort of combined these with robotic symbolic action planning things in order to get robots to um, do this kind of thing, like get robots to uh, you know, let's say here's the goal is you want to get that object and those are the tools you have so you have to figure out that you should move the object to the wall and then slide it along. Um, although here's another way to, to use that object to achieve the goal, which is, you know, bat it to yourself. Um, or there there's a piece of paper so you could push the ball onto the paper and then pull the paper, okay, for example. Or you can, um, here's a classic experiment that's been done with animals use the small hook to get the big hook. Um, 
And you know, these, so these are, uh, this is you know, really great stuff um, in robotics. Um, this paper actually, uh, I can brag a little bit about this paper because I had almost no role in it. <laughs> um, it won the best paper prize at the most recent major robotics conference, RSS. And you know, what, I think what people have been excited about, of course people are very excited about the role of deep learning in robotics as in many other areas in AI, but there's no deep learning in here at all. There is differentiable physics, so this is using an interesting differentiable program, but the key is it's using it to, in the context of a symbolic action planning system which can form goals and sub-goals and can think, I need to get the ball, so I need to get this, so I need to get that. That symbolic layer supported by an underlying layer of, of differentiable physics to actually take those plans and use your intuitive physics to make it real. Um, is, uh, you know, is, is, seems to be an exciting way to actually get robots to flexibly do behavior that they were never programmed for or trained on. Okay? And what, one small contribution we made is to show that humans do roughly similar things in roughly similar distributions of actions. Okay. Um, now, um, and, so, so I, you know, I, and I think we can point to where in the brain and, and maybe even how that's being done. But none of, those, none of these models get to an actual neural circuit implementation. So if we want to be able to do the kind of thing that DiCarlo and Yeamans and many others have been doing in the ventral stream at the single cell level with these deep networks, okay, then we actually need neural implementations of these physics engines, right? I mean, again, you could try to build one of these, you know, a deep network. I mean, I, I think, well, I think I've already, I already hopefully convinced you, or at least I argued, that you don't want to build a neural network that just you know, implicitly solves one particular physics task. You want to build a system that actually models the physics. Now then, but then you can say, well, what do you start with and what do you learn and how do you build that, right? Um, for a while, I'm sorry, for a while, Jeff Hinton and colleagues and other people interested in building recurrent dynamics models, um, like for example, this paper by Sutzkever and Hinton on the recurrent uh, constrained restricted temporal Boltzmann machine. Um, they were interested in modeling similar kinds of intuitive physics situations, but they really, you know, they're really interested in learning from scratch and not putting in any notion of objects or, or any other kind of symbols. And so they, they trained it purely from pixels, but to predict other pixels for objects in motion. And you know, there were some initial results that were impressive for the time, but what people have found since in trying to do this is that if you try to build, an, uh, call it a neural physics model that doesn't explicitly have objects, that just goes from pixels to pixels, it doesn't work very well. It, it, you can train it with a lot of data, but it, it doesn't really generalize. But what people have found excitingly is you can get some much more impressive generalization performance um, by explicitly putting in um, many of the concepts of the physics engine. And in this sense, these are models which are another way to, ha to hybridize a symbolic probabilistic program approach with a neural network. So here, these, these things, one of these is, is what was literally called the neural physics engine by Michael Chang and colleagues. Uh, that was, he, that was, I was involved in that work. It was work Michael did as an undergraduate at MIT. He's now a PhD student at Berkeley. Um, and, but there's many other versions of this idea. Batalia and colleagues have something called interaction networks, which is very similar, and um, there's a number of other ideas here. But the basic idea, which is in common to all these things, is to say they're not going from pixels to pixels, although they can be interfaced to pixels. Okay? And actually, Jia Jun did this very nicely in some work that I will mostly skip over, but it's, I'll sh show you a little of this in a second. But the, this is just working with a symbolic representation of discrete objects and their relations or interactions. So it could include things like spring couplings or collision events. Um, like a physics engine in a game engine, right? it represents the world in terms of discrete objects or like object files. Okay? Um, but where the learning of the neural network part comes in is in how the force dynamics work. So it's not given F equals MA. It's given sort of like the, out, the, the, the overall algebraic structure. It knows about pairwise interactions between objects, which are kind of like forces. And objects can have properties, which are kind of like mass, that modulate how the forces add up. Or the, you, know, you basically add up the proto forces and then, and then, and then add in some object-specific properties and out comes basically acceleration. So they're sort of given the, the kind of idea of F equals MA, but they learn about how the forces work, and they can even learn the concept of mass in some form, okay, at least in some form. And these networks can be trained on 
you know, a certain number of objects and then generalize to a much larger number of objects or different configurations like with walls that have different geometries. So they ge because they're not bound to pixels, they generalize much better. They still don't generalize nearly enough, though. So you train them to model balls ball, you know, with lots and lots of data of balls bouncing off each other, and they model balls bouncing off each other. That's not like what we have in game physics engines, where they can model blocks and balls and fluids and you know, glass of ice with you pour water in, in, into it, and there's water and ice in the glass, and you can spill it or you can drink it. Like the, 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 the level of expressiveness and flexibility that we have in today's symbolically structured physics engines is we are far from being able to build any neural circuits that can do that. But maybe this is sort of a step in that direction. Um, I think our current best models for how to think about both the, where the ventral stream and, let's say, these physics areas is, is the kind of thing that John Jin Wu and Ilker have also been working on, where we say, well, let's, let's say, okay, let's say we think that the ventral stream is doing something like inverse graphics, and we found the physics parts, then you know, basically what we have right now is we have um, deep networks for, like the ones I showed you for inverse graphics. Jajin has something that he calls the neural scene derenderer, which is sort of a more flexible object-based version that can see objects. And then our best model of the physics engine is still, it's not these neural circuits, it's still the kind of um, things that we have in game physics engines, but you know, they're stepping in that direction. But what's cool is that we can glue these things together now not train end to end, although you can tune it, or fine tune it end to end if you want, but you can, you can glue basically a deep network for object, 3D object perception in multi-object multi scenes, and then you can just glue that directly onto a game physics engine, and you can get things that can, a system which can very quickly, like because all the hard stuff is, all the, the, the things which would otherwise be slow in, in top-down MCMC inference are done in a bottom-up way by the network, um, mostly, there could be a little top-down refinement, but mostly bottom-up, can very quickly look at a scene like that and do, do basically everything that I think you need to do, which is perceive the 3D structure and then know what's going to happen. So know that, that if that scene is unstable, for example, if you look at these scenes here, think about which, how the blocks will fall. Like imagine, you know, these are like the first frame of a movie. Imagine what you're going to see when I show the movie. And then I'll show you the actual movie. And I'll show you our system imagining the same thing. Um, I mean, you really don't need, really just a quick glance is enough to figure out what's going to happen. And now I'll show you what, what actually happens. Um, on the left is what actually happened, and on the right is what our system imagined. And hopefully you imagined something similar. Yeah, did you? Okay. Um, I'll show you another one here. So take these scenes and imagine what's going to happen. And then you can see what actually happened, and you can see our system. Um, and you know, I think hopefully in your own intuition and in our system, you know, what you see is it's not, you're not probably perfectly imagining exactly what happens, right? It's not exactly right, but it's right at the level of intuition, okay? And um, it's you know, it's it's pretty close, it's, and it's also what you'd need to um, here's a few more. It's what you'd need to actually effectively plan interventions, like where would you hold it if you want to keep it up, or where would you attach it. And we can use the same kinds of systems to effectively plan interventions which keep it from falling or make it fall. All right. Um, there's other ways we've been working on trying to integrate physics engines and bottom-up perception, but I'll, I'll skip that. Although, if you're interested, check out um, the Galileo work by Yildirim and Wu and colleagues is, I think, another nice stab at that. And as our best models right now, I think, of how to integrate basically bottom-up perception and mental intuitive physics for perceiving actual physical attributes like mass, like making inferences about those. Um, and, we're, and that's the kind of thing that Sarah is starting to decode. So I just want to point to where these ideas are starting to come together. Um, and this is probably a good point to end and go to lunch. Um, but I'll just leave you with, with just, you know, give, give me two more minutes to just show you what the future we hope will look like, which is, you know, the question you started asking, the question I also started asking is, you know, how do you actually build these? There's going to be a lot more stuff next week on learning um, so, and, and development, so you'll, you'll get plenty of that. But um, if we want to say, you know, how do we, how could we, how could we build a, some kind of learning program, learning algorithm, that could actually build a physics engine, right? And it's going to be some combination of nature and nurture or evolution, development, and learning. It's not, you know, our best evidence is it's not just built in your lifetime. 
but these are genetically unfolding programs built by evolutionary exploration programs and then some kind of actual learning mechanisms in your life. But when I, when I showed this thing with Turing and I said, well, we now understand that children's learning is much more sophisticated than just you know, writing things down. Well, again, you'll, you'll get to see this um, next week, especially in Laura Schultz and then also in Sam Gershman's lectures. But what people sometimes call the child a scientist or the idea like inspired by the way scientists build their own in, you know, physics. Right? How, think about how did Newton actually come to his physics. It wasn't by finding patterns in data. It was by exploring a space of theories, seeing what made sense with the data, very limited data perhaps, right? But you know, really a lot of like creative, what Laura Schultz calls you know, goal-directed problem solving, basically goal-directed exploration in an intuitive space. So this, this, this idea that children do some kind of similar sort of theory-driven search process has been, um, again, there's a whole line of work which I don't have time to tell you about, but you'll hear some about next week, um, studying, studying children's learning from this point of view and some, and some of the ways they play with objects as a kind of like, kind of like intuitive form of in experimentation. But what we want to know is, can these methods somehow explain how you could effectively like, you know, learn to program the game engine in your head? So if evolution gives you something like a general game engine, then, then learning, is like figuring out the game of your actual life or the different games, right? Just like in game engines and just like as in, real, in our gaming life, we can learn many games, and, um, but, but somehow we have to do that, right? Um, so what, what we'd like to ask, and again, this is just the program of research going forward, is could we build effectively programming algorithms that learn to program the game engine in your head um, and that might be able to, to capture some of the developmental data. So you'll hear about, this is, this is from infant data, not by, not, mostly not from Spelke's lab, although she'll tell you a little bit about this trajectory, but uh, from work by some of the other great infant researchers like Rene Bayer-Jean, you can map out very roughly the kinds of things that infants know, let's say, about physics over the first few months and years of life. And then you could ask, well, uh, can we can we capture these different stages with say different stages in a game physics program and can we have a learning algorithm that in response to the kind of experience that a, a kid might have sort of reliably develops you from one to the other now if you actually want to build that learning algorithm it's a very hard problem um, we call it sometimes the hard problem of learning because it is much harder than the problem of gradient descent in neural networks right like the reason why people like end-to-end -end differentiable systems and out you know because you have algorithms like stochastic gradient descent which turn the problem of learning into the problem of just rolling downhill right and that's a lot easier to roll downhill than to write a program if you have the right data set which gives you the right cost function landscape but if you want to talk about like search in the space of programs that's just much harder um, and um, I think that uh, these slides aren't don't have the modification I made which is just to jump to the end so um, what you know, where, where we're going is this kind of thing. To, to, to complement what you'll hear about next week as the kind of child a scientist, if you like, is an algorithmic perspective that we call the child as coder or the child as hacker. At MIT, you know, we think hacking is a good thing. Um, the rest of the world, as Laura is always pointing out to me, thinks that hacking is like a bad thing um, when you break into people's email or credit card accounts or something. Um, but, you know, what we mean by by the child as hacker or coder is this idea that, you know, if, if effectively that learning is like programming. Um, if, if your knowledge is, is a library of programs, then learning has to be, you know, modifying your knowledge to get better. And that's basically programming, right? And think about all the activities you do when you're coding, when you're hacking on your code to make it better, right? Um, I think all of those have correspondences with what children do, okay? Um, at the moment, we only have effective algorithms for a couple of these. So like tuning parameters of existing code, that's basically what you do with gradient descent or other kinds of parameter optimization algorithms. But all these ways in which you actually modify the code or write new code or write whole new libraries of code, so-called domain-specific libraries that capture you know, the functions you need to use and reuse in a domain, or whole, write actually whole new programming languages, right? The activities of cognitive development look like all of those. Children do all of those kinds of things as they come to learn about the world, especially when they are able to access natural language, you know, a language like English, okay? Um, so, you know, I think that the, the frontier is working on algorithms that can do this. Um, 
Steve Piondadosi, of he's a former student from our department, is, is one of the leading people on this. So if you're interested, you know, I would point you to a lot of his papers. Um, a, a limitation of his work, uh, a, lo a lot of his best work, is that basically what he has tried to do is to, you know, he's developed some really cool, he's developed some really cool tools for basically doing that kind of top-down MCMC type inference that I showed you was the slow inference in like face perception, doing it in the space of programs. So he does like random walk in the space of programs. And again, if you're willing to wait long enough, you can come up with a good program, like programs that capture concepts of numbers or programs that capture uh, all sorts of interesting expressions in language. Um, but the basic problem is that, you know, just like we don't want to wait that long to see faces, well, we're, if we're modeling cognitive development, we can wait a while. It's okay. You can wait some time. It takes a while. But uh, uh, Laura, in particular, has pointed this out, and others too. You know, there's no way that kids learning, or a kids learning, is probably not just a random walk in the space of programs. It's got to be more like the way real programming works, which is more like you have goals, and those goals give you sub goals, and you actually try to solve problems. It's more systematic. So the last thing I just want to leave you with is, is what I think is an exciting, one of the most exciting developments both on the machine learning side, and this is really technical stuff, so I'll just point to it, and if you want to explore it more, you could, but also on the cognitive development side, which is the idea of basically coming up with algorithms that write code in a systematic, rational, uh, kind of Bayesian learning sense. So Kevin Ellis is a student in our department who works partly with me and also with Armando Solar Lazama, who is a, a faculty in computer science at MIT um, in the field of programming languages. So it's not, he's not a cognitive scientist or a neuroscientist. He's not even, by trade, an AI researcher. His field is the field of designing new programming languages. Armando's specialty, and it's sort of been a niche area inside the PL field, as they call it, is writing programming languages that are kind of incomplete, where the programming language fills in the code that the user hasn't gotten to yet. So in his PhD thesis, he built something 10 years ago called Sketch, where a programmer writes kind of the sketch of a code, and the machine fills in the rest. It's kind of neat if it can do that. But effectively, what he's done is he's developed very efficient tools for solving these hard search problems of coming up with code that solves a problem. And Kevin's been combining this into a Bayesian learning paradigm where you can try to find like the best code that solves some learning problem. He's applied this to a bunch of problems in linguistics, which I won't tell you about. Um, he's applied them to a bunch of problems in, um, sorry, in my earlier version of the slide before my PowerPoint crashed, these were all hidden, so I'm just scrolling through them. He's applied these to really cool things of interpreting line drawings, for example, where he can look at a hand-drawn diagram, and, um, and this is a nice interface between neural networks and, again, these program synthesis methods, where a neural network can be trained to do, again, the perception part, to go from a pixel image of a diagram to, what, to a symbolic trace of the basic objects. But then these program synthesis methods look at those and come up with the more abstract code that captures the repeated motifs. So that, for example, here, each of these cases is showing like a hand-drawn diagram, and then the machine sees it, parses it into the objects, but also sees the abstract program structure and can extrapolate it and add on layers to the diagram that were not drawn, because the machine is able to understand the program that's implicit in those scenes. So you could ask, could these ideas, you know, could we scale these up? Like, could you actually take um, all the things that a child learns over their lifetime as they're growing up? and explain them as coding. And I'm optimistic in my crazy way that we might be able to do that. Um, Kevin's latest work is, is, a, is a version of this idea, what he calls dream coder, which is inspired by some of the ideas of sleep consolidation, where you take you know, things that happen to you in the waking life, and you don't just do sort of sleep, wake sleep learning to find patterns, although these systems actually use neural networks in that wake sleep style learning to learn efficient inference. But they also do a kind of sleep consolidation where they take problems that they've solved in waking life and abstract out common, common elements that can become new abstractions that effectively write whole new domain-specific programming languages. So these are ways to, over time, progressively build up whole new languages of thinking. And you know, again, I'm, I'm just trying to show you where the, the future might be. Can we engineer this at the scale that Google wants? Not yet, but you know, stay tuned. All right, so wrapping up then, um, and um, 
uh, I know I tried to do maybe a little too much, but thanks for your patience and we'll all go to lunch now. Um, but just to wrap up, what I tried to show you here was you know, a broad view from cognitive science of what are the problems that we really care about at the heart of human intelligence, right? Can we get at this common sense core? Can we re reverse engineer these abilities? Can we understand them at the level of minds, brains, and machines and how they might even be built, okay? And I've tried to show you some of the themes that cognitive science has pointed to, which are much, much broader. Even, you, even if you don't care about intuitive physics or intuitive psychology, okay? Um, these ideas that intelligence is about thinking causally and thinking compositionally, having models with parts that can be combined and recombined, right? And where there's structure in the models that correspond to, to actual causal structure in the world, like objects and forces and agents and their plans, or the ability to have hierarchies of different levels of representation and to do inference at different levels to explain both how we can perceive in the moment what we see, but also how we can learn over longer time scales. Okay. These are ideas which I think, again, are really general themes in the study of intelligence. And I'm, I've tried to show it a toolkit that's been emerging over now a number of years. But it's getting to the point that it can be very broadly useful for, I think, a lot of people. These ideas of probabilistic programs as, as, as the kind of basic knowledge representation and inference framework, specific kinds of programs to capture, say, the heart of common sense from game engines, and then these new tools coming from program synthesis and in integrations of those with, say, Bayesian learning that might allow you to actually grow new code. And you know, what this gives us is potentially a roadmap for this, this big problem of AI, right? Like what might be AI's oldest dream. Can you build a machine that grows into intelligence the way a child does? and a roadmap for saying, well, what do we start with and what might the learning mechanisms be? I'm sure these answers aren't right. I'm sure they're very incomplete, right? But at least we have a roadmap of a place to start. And so if you're interested in this, um, it's a very big project. Um, some of you are maybe even working on little bits like we all are in your own work or in some of your projects here. But I'd love to talk with you about the bigger questions and other ways that we could all work together on these things. So thanks very much.